Spirit broods over the history of God's people, sending shafts of light to illuminate the dark. The promises of God through the mouths of the prophets ignite a welcome spark. Long years of darkness and wilderness wanderings waiting, watching for the Messiah to come. Who could foresee that a new baby crying proclaims God is with us, the light?
During this time of the year, we prepare again our hearts to receive him into our lives. As we make these preparations, make us mindful, Lord, that we are the privileged ones. Help us to be aware that we have ways that we can be of assistance to those who are not privileged ones. And may that spirit, your spirit of love, guide our every move during this time. In Christ's holy and precious name, amen. Join me in reading responsibly. Comfort, O oh comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries out the wilderness, prepare the way to the Lord, and make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every mountain shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all people shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, Cry out. And I said, What shall I cry? All people are grass. Their constancy is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades. When the breath of the Lord blows upon it, surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Yes, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Get you up. To a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings. Lift it up, do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. See, the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. His reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will Feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms and carry them in his bosom and gently lead the mother sheep. Come, Lord Jesus, dwell among us and be our shepherd. Gather us into your loving arms and lead us in the way everlasting. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
so glad to see so many of you here today. Today, I want to share with you a special story. First of all, I want to tell you I grew up on a farm not very far from here. And um, on our farm, we had cows and horses and mules and pigs and chickens. And when I was about four years old, we even had a pet pig that followed my dad around because he fed, fed the pig. Now, my father took really good care of the animals, and he made sure that they had food to eat and water to drink, and that they were safe, and when they were sick, he took care of them, too. The cows would even follow my dad around to his pasture. And when he was a little boy, his family had sheep, and he always wanted to have sheep, but we never got to have those when I was growing up. But anyway, he told me that when he was a little boy, he had to be, take care of the sheep and be careful that to keep their horse away from the sheep because they didn't get along. Well, today I want to tell you a story about Tilly, who was the sheep, and about what happened to Tilly one special night. Well, Tilly was a little lamb who loved the shepherd who took care of him. He followed the shepherd boy around everywhere he went when he wasn't following the other lambs. Tilly uh, was also very curious, and her curios his curiosity sometimes got him into trouble. And more than once, his shepherd boy had to go find him because he had wandered off or he had to protect him from a snake that he had found in a hole, or he just had to, uh, to watch out for him because Tilly was really curious. Um, now, one night, on the night that Jesus was born, Tilly and the other lambs in his flock had had a really busy day. They had played all day. They had wandered around looking for grass to eat. Um, they had just, just had a lot of fun. And you can imagine how tired Tilly was after such a busy day. So as it started to get dark, the lambs and the sheep found places to, to lie down and to rest. And um, so they were really quiet. Sometimes she would hear a little bah, 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 as they were getting ready to go to sleep. Well, all of a sudden, there was a bright light that filled the whole sky. And Tilly woke up and just was amazed, didn't know what was going on. And there was a voice that said, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I want you to hurry to Bethlehem and see a newborn baby lying in a manger. He's the Savior of the world. And all of a sudden, the sky was filled with angels singing and praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on the earth, peace, goodwill toward me. Well, Tilly Shepherd Boy and the other shepherds were frightened, of course, and they had uh, laid down on the ground when they first heard and saw the bright light. But when the um, angel told them not to be afraid, they got up and they hurried. They ran to the city of Bethlehem, which they were near that night. And you know, Tilly is always curious, so Tilly jumped up and followed the shepherd boy and the other shepherds. And they ran to Bethlehem. And Tilly trotted as fast as he could on his poor little legs. He just tried and tried to keep up with the, with the shepherd boy. And he did a pretty good job of it. And finally they got to, um, they got to where they needed to be. And they found, and um, they, they came to the stable where a bright light, a star was shining over the stable. And so they went into the stable. And in the stable, they saw other animals. I brought a little lamb to show you today. This is the little lamb. You can 
see how, how uh, small he was. And in the stable, they found some other animals. I'm going to pass this picture around, and you might see more than just lambs. There were other animals who were in the stable. There were, um, there were cows. There might have been a donkey or two. Uh, there were some other lambs and some goats. And there were even chickens that were roosting up in the rafters of the stable. But guess what? They were, all the animals were looking at something in the stable, in a manger. Now, a manger is a little raised area where a little box was sort of area filled with hay for animals to eat out of. And instead of the animals eating the hay, there was a baby lying in the manger. So Curious Tilly walked right up to the manger and um, saw a beautiful little baby boy wrapped up in clothes. And he looked at, Tilly looked at the baby and he was, he <laughs> He was excited to see the baby. And the baby turned toward Tilly and smiled at him. And all around the baby, there was the baby's mother and father and other people, including shepherds, were looking at him. So Tilly was uh, stood for a long time with the other animals watching. It was baby Jesus in the manger. And he stood for a long time. But you know what? He had had a busy day and he was tired. So in a, a little while, his eyes started to droop. And he started to get really tired and his head hung down. And so he, along with the other animals, moved out a little ways from the manger and they nibbled a little bit on some hay that was on the floor of the stable. And then they found places to lie down for the night. And you know what? Usually cows don't sleep near the, the sheep. And donkeys certainly don't sleep near goats or other animals. But that night in the night, in the stable, they laid down side by side. Until he found a little baby calf to nestle up close to to keep warm. And so throughout the night, while the mother and father were watching baby Jesus, who was sleeping peacefully, the other animals, the animals were sleeping peacefully too. It was a peaceful place. Now the Bible tells us that Jesus is called the Prince of Peace. And that he was sent to show us how to live and get along with other people and how to live in peace with one another, just like the animals did in the state of the So what happened to Tilly the next day? I like to think that he got up and he moseyed over to the manger and he looked in again and he smiled at baby Jesus. And then along with the other uh, lambs and the shepherds, they went back to the sheep and lambs and didn't Tilly have a story to tell that he had seen the Savior of the world in a little manger. So today, as a reminder, we're going to put the animals in, two animals in our manger. And I'd like for, uh, yes, you can see if you'll But I brought a lamb today that we can add to the manger. Little baby lamb. Okay. Um, and then I have a lamb for each of you to take home to add to your own nativity set to remind you of the little lamb and the Prince of Peace. So I hope that you'll take this home. And every year, Christmas, add it to your major Let's have a, I'll, I'll pass this out as you go, but let's have a prayer before we go, okay? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much.
for sending Jesus into the world. Thank you that he helps us to learn how to be like him and how to get along with others. And help us this holiday season to be curious, to be loving, and kind to others. In Jesus' name we pray. Admit it. I know you want a lamb too. <laughs> I'd like to make your holiday shopping easier. Far simpler than going online or heaven forbid going to Asheville. Um, in the pew rack in front of you, you will find an envelope. Please look at it and consider taking it home with you so that you might place something in it with some information for us. Because we have a way here at First Baptist Church for you to be generous in a particular way. We'd like to invite you to participate in our Christmas offering. This is a way for you to celebrate someone or the memory of someone through a gift. A gift to our Christmas offering that will enable the ministry and mission of our church to, to reach as far as it possibly can over the coming weeks. You will have an opportunity to complete this, and we will then, in the office, take the offering, apply it to the mission and ministry of our church, but also we'll send an acknowledgement and a very nice and lovely card to those who you would like to give this gift on behalf of, in honor of, or in memory of. Take this home with you. Consider giving a special offering in honor or in memory of someone at this Christmas. Now, let us stand. Let's continue in worship as we sing together.
Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? And the king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these, brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. And from Acts 1, verses 7 and 8, he said to them, It is not for you to know the times and dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Let's take a moment and consider the world at large outside these walls. In many parts of the world, and even in our own country, people are feeling hopeless, peaceless, unhappy, and unloved. Now, look around our sanctuary and consider what we are focusing on in the Advent season. Hope, peace, joy, and love. In the scriptures I read, Christ commissioned his church to be his witnesses throughout the world and rewarded those that gave hope to the hopeless, peace to the peaceless, love to the unloved, and joy to all. As individuals, this commandment and these tasks are insurmountable. But as a church body, they are not only achievable, but the way in which we fulfill Christ's wishes. Please remember that giving your tithes, your talents, and your time to this church will help bring hope, peace, joy, and love to a world that desperately needs it in this Advent season. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for the hope, peace, joy, and love that you give us through your Son, Jesus. As we celebrate his birth this season, help us to openly and willingly share your gifts to us with everyone in the ways that will reach the uttermost ends of this earth. In your holy and precious name we pray. Amen.
let us pray. Oh, dear God, do we ever need peace. Peace in our hearts and in our minds, in our communities, in our workplaces, in our schools, and of course in our country and in our world. God, we're a mess. We freely confess that. And especially when we consider the past week that we've had, the, the difficulties and the challenges that surprised us, the changes in plans, the, the hardships, the difficulties, the news that rocked us to our core, the, the worries that have crept in, the anxieties about this week that's to come. Our calendars are a mess, God. We've got conflicts of interest. There, there are so many additional things that we've got to do. There are things that we want to do and that we can't do. And above it all, God, we, we hunger and desire peace. We desire good sleep and, and bodies that don't hurt and that don't ache and souls that don't mourn and, and minds that are troubled. God, we ache for a peace that we cannot manufacture ourselves and that we cannot bring about by our own best intentions, God, please. Break into this moment. Break into our lives. Break into our hearts. Break into this world and bring about a peace that's radical. That is all-encompassing. That's universal. And it makes all things right. If anybody can do it, God, you can. So allow the reign of your Son, Jesus Christ, to take over and take control and bring about a peace that passes all of our understanding. Praise in Jesus' name we pray.
In this next church year, we're focusing on a brief passage from the Gospel according to Luke. To walk in the way of peace. It's what's going to occupy our attention in this coming year. And we're going to read here and now a word from Isaiah. It is a familiar passage that we hear bits of in choral music at Christmas. We see it inscribed on some of our ornaments on our Christmas trees. And yet, I have to tell you, it is a passage that I feel like should come with some kind of a warning. And also, as you listen closely, you may wonder if this sermon is being brought to you by our local veterinarian. Listen carefully to God's word for us today. A shoot shall come out from the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what he, his eyes see or decide by what his ears hear. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt around his waist and faithfulness the belt around his loins. The wolf shall live with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the ass, and the wean child shall put its hand on the adder's den. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. This is the word of the Lord. Thank Thanks be to God. God. So I learned something new this week. Well, I suppose I have known this, but it didn't really connect with me until I learned more about it. I learned that trees can regenerate themselves. That is you cut a tree down, a branch can emerge from the stump. All right, I'll tell you a secret, but I was looking this up online. I had to click on the little icon beside the definition of the word because I needed to hear how to pronounce it. The word is coppice. And some of you all know what that means. I did not. Coppice is something that people have been doing for centuries and centuries. That is, they go into a forest and they cut the trees down to the ground, creating a whole bunch of stumps. Why would they do this? Apparently, farmers and harvesters of trees have known this throughout humanity. If you do this, it actually will spark new growth. It will stimulate new life. It makes sense if you think about it. The root system, although it looks dead to me, the root system is alive. It still has access to nourishment and water. The stump, though it looks dead, can be a source of new life. And it's called regeneration, isn't it? And it describes accurately how the work of God is going to be regenerated in Christ Jesus. But here's your history moment for the day. Israel had been shot down. God's people had been leveled at the time that this prophecy was made. An axe had been placed in the hands of the Assyrians. And Israel had been felled. Now we know, of course, that it hadn't always been like this at one time. Israel had been a once vast, healthy wood. The monarchy of King David had unified the kingdom, and his offspring had been able to maintain the promised land for several generations, but the people had turned from God. We know the story. They had turned from God. God had warned them that he would hand them over to their enemies if they didn't stop, but they continued on with their godlessness. 
So the people were chopped down. Sent off into exile. Their temple, God's temple, it was destroyed. The fruit giving trees that God had planted had been leveled. But all was not lost. Enter the role of the prophet, Isaiah, who has a good word for these people who felt like they had no hope and no future. A reality that looks very much like that stump right there. The prophet would tell these individuals, a shoot shall come out from the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. God was going to bring about restoration. God was going to bring about regeneration, and it would rise up from the stump of Jesse. I have no idea who Jesse is. You look at the back of your Bible, you'll find the concordance. You go back and you look, and you remember quickly from vacation Bible school ages ago that Jesse was the father of David. Now, David, I remember. David, of course, was King David. He's mentioned throughout the scriptures. But wait a second, why? Why would it be the, the stump of, of Jesse? Why not David? Oh, that's right. David and his indiscretion. That moment with Bathsheba, that terrible decision with her husband, Uriah. This had hung on for years and years and years and apparently begun to tarnish his reputation. So the reference is not the stump of David, it's the stump of Jesse. Doesn't matter, of course. The, the point is that God is going to do a new thing through an old thing. And that right there is worth our attention. This is how God works, y'all. Through regeneration, God is going to do a new thing through an old thing. And dear Lord, do I hope he's right. The prophet says that this regenerated new branch means business. Isaiah says, the spirit of the Lord shall rest from him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel and might. The spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. I know I can't get anything by you guys. Y'all are distracted by the reality that the prophecy includes two references to the fear of the Lord. And it's back to back. <laughs> Is it a typo? Was a scribe looking at it and just copied the line above it, believe it or not, that happened? Is that what is that what is going on here? Probably not, actually. Go back to the stump. We see, of course, that it's referenced to be the stump of Jesse and not David. Solomon, however, would have been a good candidate for this reference, right? Solomon was King David's son. Under King Solomon's reign, the temple was given the life of it, right? Why not mention Solomon? As it turns out, the Bible says that Solomon did not fear the Lord with an undivided heart. Could it be that the prophet is doubling down on a Messiah who would have the fear of God in their hearts? I think it may be. Because this Messiah, this, this branch that's going to come up out of the stump, y'all, it's going to do that which David and Solomon did not or could not do. And that is to lead and to reign and to be not according to their own desires and wishes, but God's. That's what the fear of God means. It means knowing that God is God and we're not God. This Messiah, the prophet says, this Messiah is going to put God's will first. And that's the million dollar question, of course. What is God's will? I'm going to stop right there because immediately you're thinking, God's will is what God wishes for me. And we've got to step back a couple of steps. Why? Because, of course, when we hear God's will, we're going to immediately think about it in terms of what God wishes for me. What's in it for me? Not here, y'all. God's will is encompassed in this next statement that I'm about to read. In fact, it is, it gets to the point better than some of the Gospels, man. 
This line that I'm about to read to you tells what God's will and intention is through the Messiah. Here it is. This new branch will decide with equity for the meek of the earth. This new branch will decide with equity for the meek of the earth. As my daddy would have said it, God is for the little guy. God is for the poor, the meek, the oppressed, the widow, the alien, that's the stranger. God is for the hurting, the orphan, the defenseless. God is for the one who feels as though they are underneath the thumb of the powerful and those that have privilege. And you're thinking, really? Were things that bad? <laughs> Was the deck stacked so much against these people that God had to send someone specifically to care for them? To provide for these that the world and the culture had tried to, to hold down? Y'all, it's kind of like a broken down truck. And if you think about it, it still is. It reminds me of going to the farm when I was a boy. My daddy's father, we called him Pa. Well into his 90s, he still wore coveralls and went out to the barn each morning and checked on the stalls where once there were animals, but wasn't anymore. He teetered as he go across the branch there in front of the farmhouse on that little old board of a bridge. He had the best smile. He always smelled of tobacco. Always had what he called chaw. And I can imagine if I asked him, Paul, do you have a truck? He grinned. Oh, classic Roy Mathis grin. And he'd say, I sure do. And he'd take me out to see it. Now, this red truck was parked there in front of the chicken coop. And he would, I, I just know, he'd point out the tires proudly. He'd show the, the hood of the truck and, and the engine inside. And he'd even let me peek inside to see the, the steering wheel. And he'd do this with great pride. And then I'd, I'd ask him, does it run? Does it work, Paul? Oh, he'd smile and he'd chuckle and he'd grin and say, this thing had to run for decades. <laughs> this thing hasn't moved on the inch. I, it hasn't hauled anything. It hasn't gone to the feeding seed in Burnsville. It hasn't done anything. In fact, and this is where he gets serious, I wouldn't go near it. It's a place where snakes and spiders make their nests. No, son, I wouldn't go anywhere close to that truck. Are you tracking with me? This is what life was like. This is what the, the justice system was like. For the people during this time, all those people that I named, those widows, the orphan, the stranger, those who were crippled, those who were down and out. Oh, there was a justice system, all right, but it's sure the devil didn't run. It doesn't work. In fact, you get close to it, it will just harm you. And you're thinking right now, that's how it still works. For many of us, in our own context, and especially in our world. Here's the good news, y'all. God intended to send someone to repair that broken down truck. Because that's what justice looks like. And that's what the Messiah is going to do. Let's slow down for a moment, right? <laughs> I mean, this Messiah is going to have his work cut out for him, making things right, restoring broken systems. That's some pretty heavy lifting. We have no idea, y'all. God wants to bring a restoration that we can hardly fathom. 
In this Messiah's reign, that's a savior, of course. In the Messiah's reign that's to come, in, in his kingdom come, the prophet tells us that the wolf shall live with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the lion and the fat lean together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The reign of the Messiah is going to restore nature to its original God-given intention. That's what's going on here, y'all. This particularly strange image of, of animals existing together. The point is that God's reality in this Messiah is harmony. The wolf, the leopard, the lion, they're all predators. The lamb, the calf, they're the prey. And with Jesus among us, they will cohabit. They'll live together. Is that what's going on here? This is unthinkable, right? This is like thinking that Democrats and Republicans can actually work together to get something done. This is like saying that Carolina and Duke fans can be civil to one another in the Dean Dome. This is like saying that vegetarians and meat-eating carnivores can open a grocery store together. This is not going to happen. <laughs> and the prophet's not done with the crazy images. He's saved his most outrageous image for last. Now, later on at lunch, you're going to talk to your children and grandchildren, and you're going to come back to this moment in the sermon, and you're going to remind them that they were paying attention and heard what was said. It could result in death or dismemberment. Isaiah has a very odd statement in here that, to tell you the truth, is more than just a little freaky. It is flat out disturbing. If you're anything like me, you're going, oh, good. what is about to happen? Apparently, in this new realm and reign, the nursing child shall play over the whole of the asp. The asp, of course, is a snake. And you're thinking of Raiders of the Lost Ark, the asps. And that great scene where Indiana Jones drops down and everything's moving and he's terrified that he has to do this. That is an asp. The nursing child shall play over the whole of the asp. And the winged child shall put its hand on the adder's den. And the adder is a venomous snake. Y'all, this is not a good image for us. I mean, can you imagine putting this on your Christmas tree? I mean, where is this image? Where do we, where do we have this image of a small child playing with rattlesnakes and copperheads? The Messiah. Yes, the little child who leads all this will be that powerful. And his reality will be that kind of radical and that kind of transformative. <laughs> and I'm just not sure I buy it. I know I'm taking a risk in admitting this, but I mean, let's cut to the chase. Do you really buy this? That the Messiah would be that kind of powerful to, be, to bring about some kind of reality that looks like it's straight out of a Harry Potter movie. This does not seem real. Animals like this do not cohabitate. The Messiah is not going to come and take on the wicked and the most powerful light. I mean, do you think that Jesus' presence in the world is that kind of transformative, that kind of powerful? It all seems unrealistic. And yet, I must concede that if you look at the gospel, it does seem reflective of this upside-down kind of world that we see that the gospel writers describe. That is, what God values is not what we value. The rules of this world are not the rules of God's kingdom come. So, in all fairness, it is consistent with what we see in Jesus. 
point remains that when we talk about how the Messiah's arrival ushers in peace, we're talking about a God powerful enough to make everything right. Because peace cannot happen without justice. And justice is what brings peace. And the Messiah's chief responsibility, according to this passage, is to do just that. I guess I had it on shuffle, my iPhone. I was listening to some music as I was driving, and a song came up by Simon and Garfunkel. Now, I have to let you know that growing up, I cut my teeth on Simon and Garfunkel. Some of you all remember Simon and Garfunkel. Bridge Over Troubled Water, Homeward Bound. Oh my gosh, that's some good stuff. They had great, tight harmony. And if you remember, Art Garfunkel had this amazing afro. Um, and I know you're going to Google this after the service, if not right now. <laughs> so I heard a song that came on, I'd forgotten about it. It's playful and whimsical, and unless you tell me otherwise, I can't help but to think that it's, it's just for fun, right? The song is entitled, At the Zoo. And it describes a trip to the, the Bronx Zoo in New York. And some of y'all may have been there. This is how it goes. Someone told me it's all happening at the zoo. I do believe it. I do believe it's true. It's a light and tumble journey from the east side to the park. It's just a fine and fancy ramble to the zoo. But you can take a crosstown bus if it's raining or it's cold. And the animals will love it if you do. The monkeys stand for honesty, giraffes are insincere, and the elephants are kindly, but they're dumb. Orangutans are skeptical of changes in their cages, and the zookeeper is very fond of rum. Zebras are reactionaries, antelopes are missionaries, pigeons plot in secrecy, and hamsters turn on frequently. What a gas! You gotta come and see. We're a zoo, aren't we? <laughs> we are a strange, colorful, exotic, domesticated, idiosyncratic, wild zoo. Depending on our ecosystem or our culture or our surroundings, we are predator or prey. We're the tiger. We're the leopard, we're the lamb, we're the bunny, we're the snake. So we think, and perhaps rightfully so, that we best remain in our cages, separate and distinct from one another. But imagine, imagine for just a moment, if Jesus played the role of the liberating zookeeper and came with his jangling keys and opened all the cages, what would that be like? Would we be at one another's throats, terrorizing one another? Perhaps. But maybe, just maybe, the presence of Jesus is so powerful that we can be a new kind of family together. A new kind of zoo without cages or fences. It's a crazy notion, isn't it? But if you think about it, that's precisely the notion that Isaiah is trying to get across here. <laughs> For us to live in the kind of harmony that's described here, we're going we're gonna to have to do what Jesus says, of course. We're going to have to yield in his direction. We'll have to let him lead us, and we'll have to look like him, right? If things go bad, if things go wrong, if the worst thing does happen, then maybe the God who sent this zookeeper, this Messiah, can redeem it, can bring about new life out of death. You know, there's something else that they call this branch, this Messiah, this zookeeper. It's Prince of Peace. And he's right there. 
Let us pray. God, you made us to be a colorful people. And at our best, we can be and live and exist in such harmony that God would know the truth and the reality of this world, and it's anything but that. So God, send us your divine zookeepers who open up the pages to let us mill about and to see that your peace, your love, your mercy, your power is so great that we can all be there at the manger together with you at peace. For it's in the name of this new branch, this regenerated branch from the stump of Jesse that we pray these things. I invite you this morning to join this Zoom. Oh, and it, it is fun. We all bring something to it. Say yes this morning to this church. Yes. Say yes this morning to the Christ who comes to shepherd us and to show us the way of peace. Brothers and sisters, let's stand and sing. And
when you can absolutely hang that on the Christmas tree. Thank you, boys and girls. You can go and find your families and then be sure to take those home and put those on your tree. And your parents and grandparents, I'm going to tell you something, they're going to keep that for decades. <laughs> peanut butter. Y'all have been so very generous. The peanut butter is going to United Christian Ministries. Together as a community, everyone is giving some food that we're going to pack together a week from Sunday in our mission and fellowship center so that children over the Christmas break will have food to eat. We know, of course, that in our community, many children and families don't get enough food because their primary source of nutrition is during the day um, at school. And so this is a beautiful way for us to be generous. So peanut butter, creamy, chunky, low fat, no sugar. It does not matter. Except it does. We all know that the smooth is the best variety. Please bring up the, the loving kindness of food is where we can drop those all. Um, additionally, Wednesday is our shine program. We complete a Wednesday evening programming and the children are going to lead us. There will be no snakes. Join us on Wednesday. Um, at 6 o'clock for that program. Yes, and newcomers, thank you for being with us. We see you. We know that you could have been in a variety of different places. Family and friends of First Baptist Church, thank you also for choosing to be here. When we're here together, we are a lovely zoo. And God can do and he is going to do amazing things for us. Let's stand together, shall we? As we prepare to be sent out and to have some goodies and refreshment in the back, please linger around. We do so by first linking up with one another, moving around so that we can feel connected to Christ Jesus, who works to make all things new and all things right. Now, to our God, who by the power of work within us is able to accomplish abundantly more than we could ever ask or imagine. To God, be the glory of the church and to Christ Jesus for all generations, forever and ever. Amen. And let us.